It was founded in June 2020 by Dr. Ayaz Ahmed under the dynamic leadership of Dr. Ayaz Ahmed, and now we uh, comprise of a team of people. And what what our basic aim is to provide, as as mentioned in this, at least to provide knowledge, uh, to let other benefit from the knowledge which we are given. And um, the core the core um, uh, aim of our program is that. Pediatric trainees, pediatric residents all across Pakistan, they uh, the strength of training and the um, the help which they are always looking for, uh, the guidance which they they are all always looking for, so they can they can get that guidance and that help from this platform, and uh, they can uh, get a better understanding of how to uh, to go on with the training and how to excel in the fields. And our uh, long-term goal is to improve neonatal and childhood mortality and morbidity in Pakistan. So uh, the founder was, as I already told, Dr. Ayaz Samet was founder, and we have two board members, Dr. Adil Farid, who is a fellow of Pitch Cardiology, and Dr. Irshad Baji, who is uh, a CPS in Pediatrics nephrology. Nephrology. Uh, we had three members last year, but uh, now our team has grown to a lot of new members. And all of them are uh, consultant pediatrician. Is the basic requirement for uh, joining this group. You can look at. We have a Facebook page. We have an uh, an email contact if you want to contact us. We have a website which is under development, and you will you will get a lot of um, uh, helpful resources there once it's uh, it's out. And uh, you can have at a glance videos on our YouTube channel also uh, with the name of PNMDP. Okay. Uh, the upcoming sessions we have a new round from October to February, in which we'll have a lot of uh, interesting topics and practices for long and short cases, and we we also need trainees for practice classes every month um, for practice of long and short short cases. Uh, if some of you trainees are interested in coming forward and uh, and presenting their uh, their long and short cases histories and examinations in in front of others, so that you can be corrected in terms of your uh, uh, mistakes. Okay. And we have a grand mock strokes test in line, but only for those candidates who are hundred percent interested. So you have to complete the registration form, and it is both for MCPS and FCPS. Uh, you have to fill this form, and the seats are limited. Uh, the the uh, exam is to be taken in second week of September, and there will be eight to ten stations, like exactly like a real exam. Okay, so you can you can register yourself for this. If you want to join as a member, the requirements are you have to be FCPS in pediatrics, and um, plus you have to you, if you are happy to work voluntarily and if you are enthusiastic and believe in team work. Okay, you can uh, email us at contact at pnmdp.org, and then after board decision, you you will be joined. Uh, the website is in the final stages of development. You can see a few glimpses of the website here. And you you will see the the lectures uh, the recording of lectures delivered for, at this website. Uh, you can also contribute and write for our website um, if you want to contribute to any short long case section. If you you want to send image of any of your patients with their permission with a brief summary uh, of their clinical signs and what whatever treatment or uh, whatever whatever aspect of management you want to highlight in that video or image. If you you come across any interesting case or a common case with a typical presentation in your residency, you can also send us that. You can you can write and contribute to the blog section, which which can be any clinical topic like ABG interpretation, like approach to soft stretch stature, or or the other topics. And for for details of these writing, you can contact us at pnmdpp at gmail. And 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 if you write something, you contribute to something, you will be the author of that, and your name will be mentioned there. Okay. Then we have a, a regional training re representative uh, program in which you, while while being in your training, can um, uh, contribute to us and join us. And later on, you can become a member also. You can help us in connecting the sessions and uh, in in the website development and other things. 
So in a nutshell, uh, basically we want to promote quality education, quality education in pediatrics, quality education in childhood. And as a part of that, today's session is on pediatrics trauma. Uh, which is by Dr. Navida Ramban Siddiqui. He is an assistant professor and a pediatric intensivist at our Khan University Hospital. And um, uh, after the session, you will be uh, you are supposed to uh, submit a feedback survey. So um, I hope you'll make the most of this session. Dr. Navid, over to you for carrying on your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharmeen, and uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, PNMTP, uh, who has invited me to give a talk on uh, pediatric trauma. And uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to all the pediatricians who have been working uh, so far uh, in different hospitals uh, and are in a trainee position right now. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, just to uh, let you guys know that uh, this presentation can you see the presentation if it is fine? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, keep that thing in mind. Uh, that's a pretty vast topic. Uh, uh, pediatric trauma is a pretty vast topic, and I cannot cover it in uh, in an hour or so. In the next forty-five to fifty minutes, I cannot cover all of the things, but I will try to give you. Uh, uh, I will try to give you a, a, a sense and a brief uh, in, uh, intro to the pediatric trauma and how uh, these patients are being evaluated and uh, these patients are being uh, 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 managed. So uh, uh, I have no, con no disclosures uh, uh, for this presentation. So presentation we're going to cover a brief epidemiology primary trauma survey uh, for any patient who is presenting with uh, pediatric patients who are presenting with trauma uh, and with interventions, secondary trauma survey with interventions. Uh, if we're going to cover severe traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, uh, chest trauma, abdominal trauma, and non-accidental injuries. So uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, definitely you will get an idea that it's a pretty, these are each and every headings in a, are pretty vast topics. and. Uh, Third topic, you have, uh, we can uh, we can have a separate session, but uh, as the time is uh, uh, short, we're going to touch each and every topic. And uh, uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, on the chat box if you have. So uh, uh, the learning objectives of this uh, session should be by the end of this session, you will be able to conduct the primary survey. You will be able to conduct the secondary trauma survey uh, with ample history, uh, able to resuscitate the child with the trauma. Uh, basics and management of severe traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injuries, chest trauma, abdominal trauma, and musculoskeletal trauma. So uh, pediatric trauma, uh, it is a neglected disease of the modern society. Uh, uh, it's a leading cause of that uh, not, uh, in the developed world, uh, and it is the leading cause of acquired disability. Uh, and uh, uh, more than 23,000 fatalities per year occur in the U.S., uh, four disabled survivors for each death, and more than $6 billion cost for age less than 15 years of age are being uh, uh, subjected to uh, pediatric trauma. So if you're going to see the uh, annual deaths uh, due to injury from 1970s to 1990s, and, uh, they have increased significantly over the period of time. And uh, if you were going to compare, uh, uh, if you were going to see the incidence of mortality, uh, uh, although uh, the most uh, common, uh, most in, uh, uh, most common injuries which we usually see in pediatric patients are the blunt trauma, history of fall, motor vehicle accident. Mainly uh, uh, those patients who are uh, those pediatric patients who are within the motor vehicles or those uh, motor vehicle injury uh, with the pediatric uh, with the uh, children who are pedestrians. Bicycle injuries, penetrating, uh, gunshot wound have the highest mortality, stabbing wound and crush injuries. Uh, so uh, if you're going to see the death rates uh, uh, from 1970s to 1990s, uh, uh, injury versus other uh, injuries uh, and when they are being compared with the other causes, the deaths has gone down uh, from in terms of other causes, but if you're going to see the injuries that has not gone down uh, to that extent, and it continues to be, uh, it has not patued even, uh, uh, although there is a slight fall, but not as compared to the other causes. So uh, 
common mechanism uh, for the childhood trauma, it can be, as we have discussed uh, in the previous slide, that it can be motor vehicle injury, uh, either unrestrained or restrained uh, uh, motor children who are being in the motor vehicle, which can lead to uh, head and neck injuries, patient and scalp, uh, scalp and facial lacerations, abdominal injuries, especially if they are being restrained with the seat belts uh, and lower spine fractures, uh, as well as the rift fractures uh, in those patients. Uh, apart from that, in the motor vehicle injury, uh, in which the pediatric, uh, in which the children are uh, pedestrians, uh, it mainly includes lower extremity fractures because these patients are being hit by a car in the lower extremities. Uh, uh, other uh, polytrauma does include head and neck injuries, chest and abdominal wall injuries, and lower extremities. Uh, uh, usually, uh, we also see a common uh, uh, injury mechanism that is uh, children usually fall from height, uh, infants falling from height of the bed. Uh, it depends now what is the floor uh, on which they have been. Uh, fall in so uh, if it is uh, uh, low if the children has lower impact it is the upper extremity fractures if it is medium impact uh, then uh, patients uh, do have head and neck injuries uh, facial or scalp lacerations or upper extremity fractures and if the impact is quite high and they have fall from quite some some uh, uh, a good amount of height that is from first floor or second floor then they can even have chest wall or abdominal wall injuries and extremity fractures as well uh, fall from a bicycle, especially uh, uh, those uh, children who are not hel uh, wearing helmet, as it, uh, in our society, there is no culture of wearing the helmet that put them at risk for uh, having head and neck injuries, uh, facial scalps, lacerations, and upper extremity fractures. Uh, if, they, uh, if they are wearing the helmet, definitely that will going to prevent them from having uh, head and neck injuries and facial injuries, uh, and they will have upper extremity fractures and uh, in handlebar impact and uh, having abdominal injuries, mostly uh, 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 visceral organs, including uh, pancreas, liver, and spleen. So, uh, before we will move on to the uh, uh, evaluation part, uh, these are there are some uh, multiple, uh, two or three, and uh, most mostly uh, most commonly used trauma scores. Now, which are used in pediatric, this is the most commonly used pediatric trauma score in which one usually take into account uh, size of the child in terms of weight and kg, airway, if it is normal, maintained, or unmaintained, systolic blood pressure, if it's more than 90, 50 to 90, and less than 50, si CNS status, whether the child is awake, obtunded, or in coma, open wound, if it is there, if it is, it is minor or if it is uh, major, and skeletal trauma, if it is close or it is open. So uh, depending on this score, uh, uh, if the score is less than nine, the more the score is, uh, if you're going to move toward the right, uh, you can see that uh, 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 the lesser the score is, and uh, if the score is less than nine, it is consistent with the significant risk of mortality uh, and morbidity. So before moving on to the evaluation part, do we have any questions so far? So uh, there are no questions, uh, we can move forward. Uh, in the evaluation part, uh, uh, as in the ATLS, uh, uh, you must have gone through it uh, and in files as well. Uh, one must go through the primary survey and secondary survey. In the primary survey, uh, one has to go through the airway. In the airway, one has to make sure that it is patent and maintainable. In the breathing, there are five areas. We're going to discuss uh, those five areas. In the circulation, there are five areas as well that needs to be taken care of. In disability and then uh, neuro mainly neurological uh, disability, one need to look into, as well as uh, exposure uh, is skin exposure, as well as uh, temperature of the patient. Uh, once, uh, so we were going to discuss each and every area, airway, breathing, circulation, and uh, we're going to discuss it in detail and the pathologies, which needs to be taken care of of uh, during the primary survey, which you can come across those pathologies. I will not going, uh, it will be a brief, it will be brief, but uh, we will be able to see if uh, we breathing uh, or assess what will be the, uh, 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 what will be the pathology we need to look into. So, uh, 
After that, you now we will move on to the secondary survey. Secondary survey is a head to toe examination before that of focus history, which is ample uh, history uh, uh, in which uh, A is for allergy, M is for medications, if the child is on any medication, any past medical history, last meal, and the environment is important. So, uh, for the primary survey, uh, concurrent evaluation and stabilization is the key. That is, uh, uh, once you have done the airway, you need to see if there is anything needs to be done for that. And if there is anything needs to be done for that airway, you need to do the uh, stabilization of the airway at the same time. If there is something in the breathing that needs to be uh, stabilized, you need to uh, go through the stabilization phase during that time and continue to have a concurrent evaluation. They are uh, going side by side. Uh, so uh, first of all, if we will move on to the airway, uh, one must do the jaw thrust and chin lift to open the airway if the child is not being able to maintain the airway. It is very important to make sure that uh, uh, you are maintaining the cervical stabilization, especially in those patients who are with motor vehicle accidents, as well as in those patients you know, who are having, uh, also in those patients who are uh, mainly having uh, <clears throat> uh, very severe uh, uh, traumatic brain injury and in other history of falls from the height. Uh, also, uh, sometimes if they are not being, if you are not being able to maintain their airway by the jaw thrust or chin maneuver, you need to add oral airway. That is, oropharyngeal airway needs to be instituted so that you will be able to maintain their airway and they will be able to breathe through that. Uh, if they are not being able to maintain, then uh, child needs intubation that is orotracheal direct visualization of, through the laryngoscope but most important part is uh, it should be done uh, with two personnel uh, one is stabilizing the cervical spine and the other one uh, doing the orotracheal uh, intubation so that is quite important in the management of the airway uh, so after the airway we are going to move on to the breathing which is uh, uh, the in which you will do the physical examination related to the chest in which you have to see the uh, you have to see the respiratory rate is how is the respiratory rate if the child is having a work of breathing uh, nasal fearing are there any retractions supposed to any intercostal retractions uh, suprasternal retractions if there is any file chest uh, chest symmetry you need to look into if it is rising symmetrically or only one side is being rising and uh, you need to hear the breath sounds as well uh, is there is uh, decreased breath sounds on either side, which can be associated with uh, pneumothorax versus uh, pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax as well. And there can be a, a shift of the mediastinum as well, so you can see the airway uh, shifting of the trachea as well that can uh, uh, that can let you know uh, that, uh, that uh, there is a mediastinal shift. Also, uh, uh, Apart from that, uh, saturation, how much oxygen the child needs and what is the absence saturation the child is requiring. So uh, coming on to the pneumothorax, uh, usually uh, the sign and symptom, uh, the symptoms which you're going to find out in a trauma patient with a pneumothorax or a hemothorax is there will be decreased bad sounds on each side where the pneumothorax or hemothorax will gonna be. Uh, respiratory child will be in respiratory distress. There will be a mediastinal shift jugular venous distension will be there and uh, the chest will be dull versus resonant depending on the presence of blood versus air in the thorax. Uh, if the situation is unclear and the patient is stable, you are going to do the chest x-ray. But if the patient is unstable and uh, you will find these clinical findings, you need to put a catheter into the uh, hemithorax or pneumothorax above the rib and thoracostomy tube is then uh, being inserted to, uh, so that the child could be stabilized and that uh, uh, obstructive shock uh, needs to be relieved. <clears throat> Apart from that, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, another thing that has been uh, uh, looked in, in these patients, especially in pediatric trauma related to chest, is the open pneumothorax now with a suction wound. Open so uh, in this uh, there is it usually occur in the stab wound yeah, or uh, any sharp material that causes uh, uh, penetration of the chest wall and make communication with the uh, uh, atmosphere and uh, uh, so that the pleural space is in open communication with the atmosphere 
and the air rushes into the pleural space with the inspiration when uh, when the child breathes it pro it produces negative intrathoracic pressure so the air will going to move from not only mouth and nose but also from the area of the chest where the uh, where there is a uh, wound open chest wound uh, through which air will rush into it uh, uh, from the atmosphere into the intrathoracic space uh, that will lead to uh, collapse of the lungs so uh, uh, how to deal with this and uh, one can do the semi occlusive dressing over the wound such that uh, you can take uh, for example, you can take a gauze piece, apply some Vaseline over it. You can put it over the uh, chest and tape it uh, on three sides and leave it open on the other side. So that uh, once the child will have inspiration uh, that will going to stuck with the chest and it will not going to allow the air to uh, go to the wound area uh, and not allow the air to go into the chest uh, uh, from the uh, wound. Uh, however, when there is an expiration, it will going to act as a valve, and uh, uh, when the air will, uh, when the intrathoracic pressure will going to be increased during the expiration, uh, as compared to the atmospheric pressure, the air will gonna come out, and uh, it will going to push the uh, 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 semi occlusive dressing on uh, on one side, which is open. The air will gonna come out from there. So uh, uh, this is one thing that you can do for the time being until you will going to put in a thoracotomy tube. And uh, if the patient is having increased work of breathing, not being, you are not being able to maintain the uh, oxygenation or the ventilation, then definitely positive pressure ventilation, you need to get them intubated and put them on mechanical ventilation. So another thing uh, that happens uh, uh, in uh, uh, pediatric trauma, which we, uh, which we rarely see, uh, uh, fractured ribs. Uh, if the ribs are being fractured on two or more uh, sides uh, at the same rib, uh, or two or more places, then uh, the chest usually become unstable, chest wall become unstable, such that during the inspiration, when there is a negative intrathoracic pressure, the chest wall collapses um, inside the lungs, uh, leaving a lesser amount of area for the lung to open up, and uh, that also leads to lung collapse and lung damage. So, uh, 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 <clears throat> Nothing uh, should be done, for, uh, usually nothing should be done. Only uh, thing that if it is leading to the lung collapse, uh, the only treatment is that you can give them uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or positive pressure ventilation, invasive positive pressure ventilation if the lung collapses and have a slide test uh, and give them, give them time to heal uh, so that uh, the ribs uh, will gonna uh, heal uh, by itself and then uh, uh, you can wean them from the positive pressure ventilation. Apart from that, uh, we, uh, we do usually commonly see pulmonary contusions, uh, which are pretty common and pretty common cause of hypoxia in uh, trauma patient, especially related to chest trauma. So uh, any patients who is presenting to you chest x-ray does seem to be hazy as well as uh, on auscultation you are hearing crafts so it is and uh, he's have requiring oxygenation and uh, increase oxygen require increasing oxygen requirement so uh, uh, if you were going to do the CT scan in those patients and you're going to find out it will that they have many contusions so but they usually heal, uh, nothing uh, needs to be done from that point of view. You need to make sure that uh, you will going to maintain adequate oxygenation or ventilation uh, and support them with the non-invasive versus invasive ventilatory ventilation. So uh, apart from that, uh, tracheal and bronchial tear also uh, occur. With, and the sign and symptoms which you're going to find out a uh, child will be having shortness of breath. We're going to have cough, subcutaneous emphysema is pretty common. Uh, you're going to see mean external air, ongoing air leak, uh, and imaging. If you were going to see, you're going to see air, air surrounding the trachea, bronchus, and uh, uh, obstruction of the air filled bronchus. And, uh, the, uh, you'll, sometimes in a, uh, uh, if there is a large tear, they, they need to be, uh, you need to do, one need to do the bronchoscopy for its uh, identification where the tear is and surgical repair needs to be done. Uh, uh, it depends where the uh, tear is, if the tear is uh, uh, in the uh, uh, softer area of the trachea or uh, bronchus, it usually heal by itself. But if it is enough, uh, mainly larger, then it needs to be repaired and uh, surgically repaired. So before moving on to the circulation, uh, are there any questions so far uh, from the chest? 
we have done the airway we have done the breathing in the breathing we have uh, discussed about the things that you can diagnose on the primary survey uh, in a patient who have presented to you in a medical emergency with pediatric trauma so we have discussed uh, about the uh, pneumothorax hemothorax findings of these uh, uh, open pneumothorax we have discussed about trial test and we have also discussed about pulmonary contusions and uh, tracheal and bronchial trio so far so shall we move forward if it is okay or uh, are there any questions so i believe if there are no questions we can move forward uh, in the circulation and uh, in the circulation assessment i will need to uh, there are also five things that needs to be looked into. Number one is uh, you need to assess the central and distal pulses, uh, uh, central or peripheral pulses. Uh, how are they? Are they weak? They are bounding? Uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, is the child is tachycardic? You need to check the heart rate. You need to check the blood pressures. You need to check the uh, uh, heart sounds. Are they muffled or not? You need to assess the JVP. If uh, the patient is hypovolemic, definitely the JVP will be on the lower side. Uh, you are not going to see any jugular venous distension. However, if you were going to see cardiac tamponade or cardiac confusion leading to uh, 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 blood around the pericardial, uh, pericardium and causing, uh, causing cardiac tamponade, definitely you are going to see tachycardia. You are going to see JVP on the higher side. Uh, your distal pulses will be weak, central pulses will be weak, and the child will be in the obstructed shock. Uh, ECG uh, dyslipidemias are quite common, especially in those cases now where the, uh, there is cardiac contusion. Uh, so uh, one need to be pretty cautious. Uh, usually ventricular tachycardia or premature ventricular compressions are quite common uh, in these patients. Uh, remember that hypotension occurs late. So you need to... Uh, identify these patients early when they usually present. If you will going to find out that these patients are tachycardic, uh, uh, then you need to find out the cause for it. Uh, is it is mainly related to hypovolemia? Is it is mainly related to uh, any uh, hypovolemic or obstructed shock? Uh, you need to find out that reason. Uh, you need to see the JVP uh, before uh, the child will go into hypotension. Once the child is hypotensive, you don't have time, child will going to die within minutes. So you need to make sure that you, once you are in the space, you need to be, have very aggressive management so that you can save the child. So there are different, <clears throat> there are different, uh, 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 this chart usually shows you uh, and gives you a brief idea how much amount of blood loss uh, the child can have uh, uh, in terms of less than 30 percent blood loss 30 to 45 percent blood loss and greater than 45 percent blood loss and in that uh, if you will going to see it clinically uh, in the cardiovascular system if the heart rate is increased there are weak radio pulses normal systolic pressures normal pulse pressure sent uh, in the central nervous system child is anxious and irritable confused but confused the skin is mottled uh, cool extremities, prolonged capillary refill time, and urine output is low to low, very low. You can say that it is fully cured. Child is fully curic. Then the child is having minimal blood loss, almost less than thirty percent, and they need to be resuscitated. Uh, if the child is having moderate blood volume loss, uh, that is um, markedly increased heart rate, very tachycardic, weak thirty pulses, uh, low cyst low normal systolic blood pressures and, uh, and very narrow pulse pressure such that uh, uh, pulse pressure are quite low less than 20 uh, and the child and in cns you are going to see the child is lethargic dull response to pain in uh, skin you are going to see that they are there is a markedly prolonged capillary refill time and they are clamped and mottled uh, urine output is usually minimal they are uh, near to aneuric and uh, if you were going to see the patient with severe blood volume loss, which is in 45% blood loss uh, of their total body blood volume, uh, then uh, the child will be tachycardic followed by bradycardia. And this is the period uh, these children usually require aggressive management in terms of blood transfusion. You need to transfuse an O negative blood group uncrossed match so that you can save their life. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, they are usually hypotensive, they have narrow first pressure, they are comatose, pale, cold, and uh, uh, have no urine output. So, uh, so direct one thing that needs to be done if you will going to, if you 
see there is an ex external feed and you need to put a direct pressure into it. You need to have an intravenous. If you will not be able to get the intravenous line and within five minutes, you need to get an intravenous line and start resuscitating the child. Uh, that is important. Obtain blood for hemoglobin. The most important part is send the type and cross match. Sorry, labs are jati hai, but type and cross match nahi hota. That is quite important because you need to send it. It will going to take half an hour to one hour time for them to have cross match so that you can give, if needed, you can give the patients uh, uh, cross match blood group. Uh, uh, Arterial blood gas, uh, you can do it to find out uh, how much uh, uh, how much acidosis does the child have and uh, how much anaerobic metabolism the child is having because of the blood loss. Uh, uh, fluid resuscitation with 20 ml per kg, uh, you can give it normal mean as well as you can give a lactate, whatever is available. Uh, but uh, in any patient who is having internal or external bleeding, uh, make sure you are not uh, resuscitating them with the fluid. Uh, otherwise, they were going to make them more hemodiluted and uh, oxygen delivery will be compromised and they will going to be in the, you will going to be in a vicious cycle. Uh, repeat uh, the bolus if necessary, you can repeat it twice. Uh, so blood transfusion, if the, as I have mentioned, if the patient is unstable and the patient has blood loss and uh, the patient is, you are not being able to maintain the hemodynamics, the patient is hypotensive, cold family, uh, you need to give type O negative uncross matched blood group. Sometimes if it is not positive, if it is not present, you can even give O positive blood group. You need to give it within uh, and make sure uh, you will, in this uh, scenario where the child is have lost almost more than 45% of the blood volume, uh, you don't need to give it in one hour or two hours. You need to just give it as a pull and push method and you need to give it uh, in five to 10 minutes or 15 minutes whole blood volume, whole uh, one to two pack RBCs, you need to give it to them. Uh, if the patient has a, a cardiac tamponade, you have muffled heart sound, narrow uh, pulse pressure, jugular venous distension, these obstructive shock needs to be relieved. Otherwise, whatever uh, you were going to do, if you were going to give them fluid, you're going to give them inotropes, they will not be, if the obstructive shock are not being relieved, you will not be able to save them. But a cardiosynthesis uh, is the key. You need to put a needle in, uh, uh, in these epistonal area so that you can relieve the uh, uh, cardiac nephronite. Also, you need to, uh, if there is a tension pneumothorax, they can give you the similar findings and you need to relieve the, uh, tension pneumothorax as well. So apart from that, uh, coming on to the massive blood tra transfusion, when we usually think of uh, transfusing uh, patients uh, quite a lot, then uh, you need to be aware what is uh, uh, massive transfusion. Uh, the adult, excuse me, uh, just, just a minute if you can hold on. Sorry, sorry for uh, uh, interruption. So, uh, for the massive transfusion uh, in adult, it has been uh, defined uh, if the patient is having un ongoing uncontrolled bleeding, and uh, they are being transfused ten pack RBCs over twenty four hour period, or they require four units of pack RBC over an hour, uh, they are said to have massive transfusion. This is an adult uh, uh, definition for uh, massive transfusion. But if you were going to see uh, uh, in the children, it is slightly complex because if you were going to see the estimated blood volume in the children, it varies with the child's children's size as well. For example, in infants, estimated blood volume is 80 to 90 ml per kg. If you were going to see older children, more than three months of age, estimated blood volume is 70 ml per kg and in the adults it is uh, estimated blood volume is 60 to 65 ml per kg. Uh, so considering that uh, 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 massive transfusion has been defined in children with transfusion of greater than 50% estimated blood volume uh, over three hours period or transfusion of 100% uh, estimated blood volume that is uh, according to the age over the 24 hours period 
or transfusion to replace the ongoing blood loss at greater than 10% of the estimated blood volume per hour, it is not per minute, sorry. So uh, uh, that is quite important. You need to keep that in mind. If you are going toward the massive transfusion and the child fits into the criteria, you need to make sure that you should follow the massive transfusion protocol. Uh, the most important thing in the massive transfusion protocol is uh, you need to give them uh, Whenever you are giving them PEC RBCs, you need to give them uh, uh, plasma as well as platelets uh, so that you are not going to have dilutional coagulopathy. Uh, you need to give them uh, PEC RBCs, platelets, as well as uh, FFPs in a ratio of one is to one is to one. It depends on how much the size of the child is. Uh, other laboratory, well, other than that, Apart from the uh, massive transfusion and transfusing them the blood products, you need to monitor the temperature because uh, these blood products are usually cooler and a uh, patient can have hypothermia. Uh, apart from that, uh, you need to avoid and treat hypothermia in these patients. You can use a fluid warmer or you can use, you can warm the uh, blood products by going through the warmer, you can attach it, or you can attach a beer hagger if needed to the patient. You need to avoid and treat acidosis as needed. Sorry. I think for someone, uh, mic is being open, so I will going to mute it. Thank you. So uh, apart from that, uh, uh, you need to avoid and treat acidosis as needed with the bicarb. If the pH is less than 7.2, you need to treat it with the bicarb or if you have a time solution, you can treat it with that as well. Uh, definitely with the massive transfusion, once you are giving more amount of blood, uh, like RBCs, uh, it contain calcium, uh, it contain oxalate. So, uh, you need to treat them for hypocalcemia. They are at risk for uh, uh, low ionized calcium. And in order to man and maintain homeostasis as well as hemodynamics, because calcium has its role not only in the hemodynamics, but also it has a role in, co uh, in coagulation as well. So you need to make sure you are being able to maintain adequate calcium status in, the, in these child who are having massive transfusion. Uh, the blood test which you wanted to, you will going to do in these patients, you need to do a blood gas, lactate, hemoglobin, ionized calcium, electrolytes, and INR, PTA, PTA, uh, and uh, type and screen CBC, fibrinogen. Uh, needs to be done and you need to do it to hourly until the massive transfusion protocol stops. Uh, if it is not available to hourly, you can do it two or four hourly as well, uh, uh, depending on the uh, severity of the child uh, illness and uh, how frequently the, the transfusion is needed. I guess uh, this is a uh, uh, this is uh, a machine through which if you're going to put a uh, uh, blood sample, it will going to give you, uh, it will going to create some graphs that will going to guide you and that will going to dictate you what blood products are being needed. Is the child, does the child needs FFP? Does the child needs platelets? Does mm -hmm. the child needs cryoprecipitate? Or if the child needs separate coagulation factors, so, now, so uh, that will going to tell you. Uh, TAG stands for uh, electro, uh, it is, Thromboelastography. Is that okay? Currently, TAG is not, uh, I'm not sure it is only available in the uh, uh, cardiac anesthesia where the cardiac coronary bypass uh, machine is being run. And sometimes, if they have difficult cases, they usually run the sample in TAG. But uh, uh, the only drawback is it will going to take uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes to give its output. So uh, in a child who has been bleeding actively, you can't wait for 30 minutes to one hour to get tag results. So that is the one of the drawback uh, for the tag as well. But at least you will be able to find out you know, what factors uh, are being needed and you can give that. Thank you. So we'll move forward. Uh, uh, the other important thing, uh, different hospitals have massive transfusion protocol as well. So uh, it includes the blood bank, OR and uh, 
laboratory and the person usually just give a phone call to the blood bank and activate the massive transfusion protocol and they and send the uh, type and screen and they will going to send you blood products every now and then every uh, 30 minutes to one hour so that uh, until you will going to call off the massive transfusion protocol to the blood bank so uh, they're going to emergent, uh, emergently release two to four units of pack rbcs and uh, then uh, according to the need of the patient uh, optional, uh, as it has been mentioned, uh, factor seven can be given at a dose of 50 to 90 units per kg, maximum of three doses, two hours apart, and chiropractic can also be given. So uh, once the uh, uh, um, trans massive transfusion has been uh, dealt with, and if the patient has stopped bleeding or the bleeding has been controlled, then you need to call the blood bank to stop massive transfusion protocol. And uh, when the bleeding is no longer life threatening and it is being under control. So, in the uh, uh, cardiovascular injury, we have talked about the uh, uh, cardiac tamponade, we have talked about the obstructive shock, we have talked about uh, cardiac confusion leading to arrhythmias. Uh, patient can have aortic injuries as well. Usually, if the patient has aortic injury, they can't survive the, uh, the time period for the aortic injury. If the aortic injury is uh, they have very minimal time period uh, uh, to present to the hospital. And if they present, they are usually moribund. Uh, but sometimes aortic injury uh, usually occur to uh, limited aortic injury occurs leading to aortic dissection that can lead to unstable blood pressure, uh, especially lower extremities. Uh, blood pressure are usually, there is a difference of blood pressure, lower extremity, and there is paraplegia associated with it. If you were going to do the chest X-ray in these patients, and if you were going to see the wide superior medius channel, always consider aortic injury. You need to rush the patient to the uh, uh, CD scan for CT angio so that you will be able to diagnose that, and the patient should be rushed to the OR uh, and for the by the cardiothoracic surgery and uh, abnormal aortic knob you can see it on the chest x-ray as well as left hand corner so is everything is clear from the circulation point of view so the things which we have discussed in the circulation is the resuscitation with the uh, fluid blood products as well as um, the things which we can find out in the circulation in pediatric trauma patient and uh, how to uh, deal with patients who have massive transfusion and how to resuscitate them. Uh, and also we have discussed about the aortic injury uh, in the circulation. We are still on the primary survey so far. So these are the things that you can identify in the primary survey with you. It is very quick. You need to do it within five minutes, within a few minutes uh, when the child presents to the ER. Coming on to the uh, Next, which is disability, which is a uh, brief neurologic examination uh, level of consciousness. You, will, you need to uh, assess whether the child is alert, response to vocal stimuli, response to uh, pain or unresponsive APVU, uh, uh, which we usually uh, abbreviate it for, and this needs to be done. If you don't know, uh, if you don't remember this, you can easily do the GCS. What is the GCS of the child? If the child is opening the eyes, verbal and motor, uh, it should be uh, 3 to 15, and you need to uh, categorize that from uh, neurological status. And uh, you can also do the focus outline of unresponsiveness, that is four score. Uh, uh, this is pretty uh, important uh, in terms of because it does incorporate brain stem reflexes as well as respiration, apart from the eye response and motor response. So uh, uh, although, uh, uh, Eye response is almost same as we usually uh, look into the DCS. Motor response is almost same as well. Uh, if you were going to see the brainstem reflexes, it mainly take into consideration pupil and corneal reflexes. If one pupil is wide or fixed, that is anacephalic pupils. Pupil or corneal reflexes absent. When both pupil and corneal reflexes are absent, and absent pupil, corneal reflexes and cough and cack. Uh, in the respiration, it does matter whether the child is having regular normal breathing pattern, central breathing, that is kind of stroke breathing pattern, irregular breathing. If the child uh, is intubated and have his own respiration or not, if the child is apneic and breathe at the ventilatory rate. So these are important things that 
uh, you through which you can assess. Uh, there are three scoring you can do uh, to assess what is the neurological status of the child. Uh, then comes the exposure uh, and environment. You need to prevent hypothermia. You need to expose uh, uh, the child, undress the patient. You need to see the skin. Are there anything that you should not miss? Uh, young children, because young children are with large body surface area and mass and you should go. Other than that, uh, once your primary survey is being done, you need to then, uh, uh, it is now the norm in the emergency department, they have the ultrasound uh, with them and they usually do the point of care ultrasound, including chest to see the pneumothorax or uh, pleural effusion or any uh, fluid in the chest, any fluid in the pericardium, any fluid in the uh, abdomen. They're going to uh, assess the uh, uh, liver, spleen, as well as uh, free fluid in the abdomen. And they're going to do a quick echo to see how is the function, as well as if there is any pericardial effusion and uh, ultrasound chest to see if they are, <clears throat> if the child is having any uh, hemothorax or pneumothorax, air or fluid in the lungs or in the chest. Apart from that, uh, Chest X-ray can be done uh, as we have discussed it earlier uh, to see uh, uh, whether the mediastinum is wide or it is <clears throat> normal. You can, can see the cardiomegaly. If you are going to see the cardiomegaly, one must be pretty cautious and it should be highly suspicious of pericardial effusion. Pneumothorax and hemothorax can be easily identified on the X-ray. Uh, lateral neck X-ray are usually done to see the cervical spine. Pelvic uh, AP X-ray are usually done to see the pelvic fractures and CT had, if the patient usually have uh, a very bad trauma with polytrauma, uh, so, and you are expecting that the child have multi, child can have multiple injuries and then pack it so hard as uh, it occurs in motor vehicle accidents, as it occurs in history of fall from first, second or third floor. Uh, and in those cases, uh, CT had chest abdomen should be done uh, right away. Although uh, sometimes it does take time uh, for the CT scan to be done. So therefore, uh, uh, that's the reason why uh, in the ER now, we usually do focus uh, uh, point of care ultrasound for the chest and abdomen. So uh, we'll move on to the secondary survey. Uh, in the secondary survey, it starts from uh, ample history, that is A for allergies and for medications, B for past history, uh, L for last meal and E for uh, event. Uh, once you have taken uh, the ample history, uh, during that time period, uh, you have done the primary survey, you have done the initial imaging, and now you know moti moti cheese you have uh, uh, rule out curly hai. You have rule out, uh, uh, those things that are life-threatening. Now uh, you're going to move toward the ample history and then you are going to move toward the uh, secondary survey. In secondary survey, it is mainly head to toe examination. In the head, you need to inspect for the battle sign, raccoon eyes, hemotympanum, that is if you were going to see the, uh, uh, through the otoscope, you can have uh, blood within the uh, uh, <coughs> middle ear uh, cavity it can uh, it can be seen through the uh, otoscope one can have csf leak uh, which is uh, through which uh, one can have an idea that this patient can have these lyrical fractures uh, one can palpate the head uh, for the depressed fractures and hematomas uh, complete cranial nerve examination if the child is awake. If the child is not awake, you need to do the limited cranial nerve examination to make sure that that will going to give you an idea. If the child has intracranial bead, uh, at what level the intracranial bead is and uh, what's the status. Uh, repeat primary assessment, no anti-tube needs to be given if there is a facial trauma or if there is a CSF leak, because if there is a basal skull fracture, you might put uh, your NG tube might go through that fracture into the brain and that can cause more injury. So uh, now we will going to, uh, as we are on the head right now, so we will going to discuss uh, briefly about the TBI. Uh, uh, patients with the traumatic brain injury usually have primary injury. 
that is uh, they can have confusions and uh, external shearing and uh, secondary injury which usually occur uh, because of the hypoxia and ischemia cerebral edema and increased icp so the primary injury occur at a time of trauma uh, which is the primary insult to the brain which is a direct insult to the brain uh, which can lead to confusion or axonal shearing leading to uh, axonal loss and uh, secondary injury occurs after the primary injury when the child presents it starts after the primary insults and uh, if the child develop hypoxemia or ischemia due to the hypovolemia or low oxygenation uh, they can have uh, secondary injury to the brain if the child has cerebral edema and that is not been adequately dealt and uh, measures are not being taken to get the cerebral edema down uh, <clears throat> definitely the child will have uh, ischemic injury to the brain if the child has increased intracranial pressure and uh, if that is not being dealt with definitely that increase in intracranial pressure can lead to del deleterious outcome and uh, it can cause significant brain ischemia. So uh, what are the patterns? It can be group or contour group. Group is uh, direct injury to the brain at the site of impact and contour group is the, uh, if you have an impact, uh, uh, the brain will usually uh, have a hit on the posterior part of the skull uh, from the inside and uh, that is called contour group injury. Uh, other than that, now one can have frontal uh, lobe contusions, which can lead to behavioral discontrol and mood swings. Temporal lobe contusions can lead to short-term memory uh, issues as well as receptive aphasia. Uh, and uh, patients can have diffuse axonal injury due to the shearing uh, uh, forces, rotational acceleration or deceleration forces leading to altered level of consciousness. So these are some of the uh, uh, symptoms which you can uh, which can guide you uh, where the confusion could be before you were going to move them towards the CT scan and further imaging. Common patterns, uh, uh, one of the patterns uh, which we usually see is the epidural, epidural hematoma. You can see that it causes convexity in the CT scan if you were going to see. And uh, usually it is an arterial bleed. Um, most commonly middle meningeal artery is involved. It can lead to lucid interval, contralateral hemiparesis, altered mental status, ipsilateral blown pupils, that is an anacephalic pupil, and it's a neurological emergency. And if, the, if, if that is relieved and brain edema is relieved uh, by evacuation of the hematoma, uh, the child has a pretty good outcome. Usually uh, TBI in children does have a pretty good outcome as compared to the adults. Uh, for the subdural hematoma, uh, usually patients does have concavity uh, 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 and it is mainly related to the bridging veins when they usually rupture due to the shearing forces. And uh, for subdural hematoma, uh, if any patient has subdural hematoma, that shows that they have, if their head have shared a significant force. It does not occur with just if the patient lies down, uh, fall from the bed or anything uh, like this, but it's, it's significant force due to which uh, these breathing vein structures. Intracerebral hemorrhage can give you focal findings uh, uh, and seizures. Uh, one can have depressed skull fractures and basal skull fracture can lead to uh, posterior auricular bruise. Uh, uh, if you will have a bruise behind the ear in the uh, uh, mastoid, uh, where the mastoid uh, Ears, uh, must right. Ear is uh, definitely you need to consider that the child would have a little fracture. Raccoon eyes uh, uh, usually occur, the eyes become black, and all the ocular muscles, and there is a blood accumulation around the eyes uh, that. And the child looks like uh, having the phone eyes. Uh, usually, there is a fracture in the orbital uh, bridges. Uh, CSF leak and anosmia and nausea and vomiting, all these findings uh, should give you a suspicion that there is a basal risk of fracture, and that has been confirmed by doing a CT scan and 3D reconstruction. So uh, if you were going to see uh, what our intracranial contents are, brain usually constitute 80% of the inside, the inside the skull. Uh, CSF constitutes 10% and blood constitutes the rest 10%. And uh, usually there is nothing else uh, within the brain. So 
if you were going to see uh, uh, in a normal brain, and if this line shows the ICP, uh, if uh, if there is an increase in the brain volume, if there is a mass effect due to the hematoma, due to the tumor, or anything else, or due to the uh, edema, it causes displacement of the venous as well as displacement of the CSF in order to accommodate that part. But uh, it happens, uh, there is a compensatory mechanism through which these things happen uh, that uh, blood, will gonna, uh, blood will gonna be drained more and it will going to give more space to the pain and CSF will gonna be uh, drained as well. And this is usually a compensatory phase, but then uh, a patient can go into the decompensated phase of raised ICP where the ICP shoots up. Uh, uh, if you were going to see, uh, and a uh, point after which uh, a critical point after which any slight increase in the uh, uh, brain mass within intracranial volume can cause significant increase in the uh, ICP that is intracranial pressure. So uh, any patient who is presenting with the uh, traumatic brain injury, you need to make sure that you are treating them for the seizures, hypoxia, hypercarbia, and diffuse sweating. You are treating them for that because these are the source of secondary uh, injury. You need to make sure that they are not doing, they are, uh, you, are dealing with, you are dealing with those. And if it is a rapidly expanding mass lesion like those in hematomas or in some uh, posterior fossa tumors, you can see uh, herniation syndrome like pupillary dilatation and ansiopericutal systemic hypertension, bradycardia, and extensive posturing. And this is, that's an emergency, that's a medical emergency. Uh, you need to hyperventilate them with 100% oxygen in order to reverse your pupillary dilatation. Uh, you can, if you are bagging the child, for example, at a rate of 15 or 20, you need to double the rate of bagging so that you can maintain the CO2 of around 25 to 30. Um, mentol hypertonic screen needs to be given during that time period. Mentol at a dose of 0.5 to 1 gram per kg and hypertonic screen uh, 3 to 5 mL per kg needs to be given within 10 to 20 minutes period. Uh, if there is a EVD in place, you need to put it under continuous drainage and you need to ensure that the child is uh, intubated well sedated and, and have analgesia. And you need to rush them to the CT scan and involve the neurosurgery so that they are aware that this child needs urgent surgical intervention. So what is the criteria for intubation uh, in patients with the head injury? If the Glasgow coma scale is less than 10, or if there is a decrease in the Glasgow coma scale of greater than three, independent of the initial Glasgow coma scale. For example, if the patient has presented with a GCS of 15, and now he has a GCS of 12, uh, the GCS has been on the declining trend, and it has been progressive. You don't need to wait for the GCS to go below seven or eight uh, in order to intubate. You need to uh, 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 preempt that uh, this deterioration will going to proceed further and you need to take over so that you can control the hypercarbia and you can control the respiration. And as a courier, if there is, uh, definitely you need to intubate and you need to hyperventilate them and do, uh, give them manitol and hypertonic scene. You need to make sure that cervical injury uh, <clears throat> If uh, cervical spine injury is compromising the ventilation at the C3C, uh, uh, C3C5 level, you need to intubate them and uh, put them on mechanical ventilation because their diaphragm is paralyzed and they are not being able to ventilate. Uh, if the patient is apneic and having hypercapnia with a PSCO2 of more than 45, you need to ventilate and make sure that the PSCO2 is uh, in the, within the normal limits between 7.35 to 7.45. If there are loss of pharyngeal reflexes, patient is not being able to maintain the airway, you need to intubate them. And if there is spontaneous hyperventilation causing uh, PSCO2 to be less than 25, then in order to control uh, PSCO2, you need to sometimes uh, uh, make them intubated, make them well sedated so that you can control the CO2 to keep them toward the normal side. Because more CO2 you are going to blow out less than 25 can lead to uh, cerebral vasoconstriction, leading to more infarction and cerebral edema. So what are the measures uh, uh, you can use in reducing the ICP? You can reduce the brain volume. Uh, uh, brain volume. If there is a hematoma, it needs to be evacuated. If there is a brain tumor, that needs to be evacuated. Brain resection needs to be done. And you can shrink the brain. Uh, there are three types of edema. 
it's usually occurs one is vasogenic edema which surrounds the mass lesion it, this mass lesion can be tumor or it can be hematoma as well there can be interstitial edema that is transudation of fluid uh, from high csf pressure you have uh, you must have seen it with the obstructive hydrocephalus and with uh, csf usually seepage across the ventricle into the paraventricular spaces and uh, cytotoxic uh, uh, edema in which uh, it occurs mainly due to interest with cellular injury resulting in intracellular edema so uh, uh, if you will going to see osmotic agents and uh, usually uh, uh, are commonly used in order to shrink the brain. You can use mannitol and hypertonic mean in these cases. The steroids uh, usually reduce vasogenic edema around the tumors or around the hemorrhage, but does not cause uh, dec uh, uh, decrease edema in other causes like that of interstitial or cytotoxic edema is not um, treated with steroids. So that should be kept in mind, uh, especially when you are dealing with uh, traumatic brain injury. So steroids are not usually used in traumatic brain injury, but if uh, the patient has presented to you after the tumor removal, you have you would have seen the uh, patient to be on steroids, dexamethasone, high dose, uh, they usually use it to reduce the vasogenic edema around the tumor which they have resected. So uh, how many to lower the ICP via which mechanism? So this is a quiz which I have uh, put it in a, it, is it is mainly related to diuresis, uh, it, which decreases the intracranial volume? Is it is mainly related to decreased blood viscosity? Is it is related, uh, which can lead to shrinking of shrinks of pain and uh, all of the above? What do you guys think? Any answers? Awesome. Yeah. So it's uh, very good. So it's uh, mainly all of the book. Uh, Kareem is right as well as uh, so uh, hyperosmolar therapy. Uh, uh, usually, mannitol is being used uh, only now in the cases of uh, impending herniation. Uh, and most commonly now, 3% hypertonic screen is being used at a dose of 2 to 5 ml per kg over 10 to 20 minutes. And they can be given every four, uh, 8 to 6 hourly. You can use it in uh, with the continue, as a continuous infusion as well as 0.1 to 1 ml per kg per hour. And uh, also uh, you can use, uh, even in refractory cases, if the patients have a refractory uh, uh, raised ICP, one can even use 23.4% hypertonic mean at a dose of 0.5 ml per kg with a maximum of 30 ml. So this is a busy slide. I will not go into uh, very much detail. Uh, there you have, if you have signs of herniation, uh, I have already discussed about it, uh, that you need to go through the emergency treatment that is hyperventilated, dip mentor, hypertonic screen. If there is any video, open it to the continuous drainage, consider the emergency CT and get the surgery in, uh, involved in it so that if there is a surgical cause that can be relieved. Uh, other than that, uh, it is the recommendation now in any patient who has a severe TBI with a TCS of less than eight, they should have ICP monitor inserted. Uh, you need to maintain appropriate analgesia and sedation. You need to make sure they are well sedated. They are not agitated because agitation can cause increased ICP. Uh, you need to make sure they are uh, on mechanical ventilation and you need to give adequate arterial oxygenation and PaCO2 around 35. You need to maintain normothermia. Uh, it should be around 35 to 37 in between, not 30, not more than 37. You can maintain it either with uh, regular uh, paracetamol or uh, regular antipyretic uh, medications or by the cold blankets as well. Uh, <clears throat> and cold uh, water sponging. Uh, ensure appropriate intravascular volume to maintain the CVP as well as uh, cerebral perfusion pressure. Maintain the hemoglobin more than seven. Uh, uh, higher level may be optimal on advanced monitoring. Uh, treat the coagulopathy. If there is a coagulopathy, one need to treat it. Elevate the head end of the bed uh, at 30 degrees. Uh, if the patient is presenting with severe TBI, that is TCS less than eight, you need to load them with the phenytoin or levetiracetam and get a continuous EEG or an EEG done to make sure that they are not in long-term with the uh, So if the uh, uh, 
patient has ICP monitor or you have EVT, you can uh, do the CSF drainage. Uh, you can give them bolus of infusion or bolus or infusion of hypotonic scene as we have discussed. You can give it in six to eight hourly boluses of hypotonic scene or continuous infusion one, one to one ml per kg. Additional analgesia needs to be given neuromuscular blockade if they are not being well sedated and uh, so that uh, they will not have off gag and uh, they are not irritable. Uh, and uh, if the patient is not responding to these treatment, then we need to move toward the second tier treatment. In the second tier treatment, uh, if the patient is not responding to the medical therapy for the first tier treatment, then one need to repeat the CT scan to see if there is any change in the status uh, from the uh, beginning. And uh, one need to see if there is a, a newly expanding surgical lesion like hematoma surgery is indicated. One can do the surgical intervention. One can even, uh, if there is an increasing edema despite of these medical measures, one can do the decompressive craniotomy, uh, barbiturate infusion for barbiturate coma, moderate hypothermia, hyperventilation, high level of postmortem therapy. Remember, hyperventilation cannot be done over a longer period. You need to do it for few hours just to buy time in order to reverse the NSF for or impending herniation. And you can even use 23.4% uh, selenium as well. So that is all about the uh, uh, TBI. Uh, I will going to move on now toward the neck. Uh, um, as we move up from the head. Uh, tenderness, if there is a neck tenderness, strangulation, ligation, mark, fatigue, choking. Uh, so uh, one need to look into. Uh, developmental consideration needs to be looked. Uh, if you are dealing with the younger child less than eight years, then uh, spinal cord injury is usually lead to occiput and C2 injuries. While if you are dealing with the older children, it is C3 to C7. Uh, one need to make sure that they should have this, that thing in mind that a spinal cord injury without radiological abnormality can also be found. Uh, even if you have done the MRI and the child is symptomatic, then you need to make sure that they are maintaining the neck collar. Uh, motor vehicle accident are the most common etiology. Sports related injuries uh, are usually equivalent to motor vehicle uh, accidents in young teens. Uh, uh, and most common uh, which we have is football and hockey. These are the uh, common, the common sports to which uh, one can have sports related injuries and cricket as well, for sure. Uh, for the imaging, uh, AP and lateral chest x-rays needs to be done, CT, MRI spine, or this MRI for the cervical spine. Uh, as we have discussed, uh, uh, Shivora uh, occur in 19 to 34% and pseudosubluxation can occur in children. Uh, it is Almost, it is that much common that 40% of the children less than eight years have uh, 3mm displacement of C2, C3. So uh, if there is a complete loss of motor or sensory sensation function, definitely there is a complete transaction of the spinal cord. If it is in the higher cervical area, uh, there is a loss of descending sympathetic chain, isolateral ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis, which is corner syndrome, uh, which can give you a clue. If, Usually, patient can present with a spinal shock if the lesion is above T6 because they usually lost the sympathetic outflow, leading to vasodilatation, hypotension, and bradycardia. They should be resuscitated with the fluid resuscitation and alpha agonist. Anterior spinal artery syndrome can also occur in which there is a motor loss, variable sensation, loss of pain, temperature, and um, uh, proprioception and vibration. Uh, so, steroids are not a treatment for these that should be kept in mind. Uh, I will not go into the detail of why, uh, when to do the cervical spine because of the time constraint. Uh, let's move on to the abdomen. We have one uh, case scenario through which we're going to quickly move on to the abdomen. Uh, this is a five-year-old child riding his tricycle when his father back his pickup uh, truck out of the garage and feels a bump as he pulls out. He hears a scream and finds his son crying after being run over. He takes him to the hospital. So his weight is 20 kg. Respiratory rate is uh, 100 per minute. Heart rate is 100 per minute. Respiratory rate is 25. Blood pressures are uh, 72 by 32. Alert but fearful and crying. Family survey have no injuries to the head and chest. Uh, tire track across the upper abdomen, diffuse abdominal tenderness and distension. So uh, there are 
what do you think uh, should be uh, the early management needs to be done in this case? So one of the doctor has asked about what is Shivura. Shivura is with a, uh, it is spinal cord injury without radiological, without radiological abnormality. So sometimes uh, one cannot pick up uh, spinal cord injuries uh, uh, radiologically. So these are being called, and this is pretty common. So one should keep these things in mind when dealing with it. So yes, everyone is right on the toes. Uh, the answer is four that is place an IV, NG tube, send labs, test, train chest x ray, and pelvic pain. Give uh, 400 ml, that is 20 ml per kg of finger lactate. So that's spot on. So after you have given 400 ml of finger lactate twice, heart rate has improved from 140 to 120. Blood pressures have improved. There is a good perfusion, airway, and feeding remains good. There are no new findings on the secondary survey. So that's good. But what should be the next step? Are you going to perform the diagnostic peritoneal lavage? You're going to order abdominal CD scan with IV contrast, send him to the OR for exploratory laparotomy, or call CT surgeon, as cardiothoracic surgeon for trichotomy in the emergency department. So that's good. Everyone is right. Uh, very good. So uh, uh, one should order abdominal CD scan with IV contrast so that one should identify what is the because there is a tire mark on the upper abdomen and uh, the child will be at risk for uh, abdominal injury. So CT abdomen has been done and it does show a uh, grade four splenic laceration with free peritoneal blood. His vital signs remain stable as does the exam which we have done. So what you will going to do at this point in time? Are you going to take him to the OR? Is that for possible splenic to me? You are going to admit to PICU for observation and serial blood work needs to be done. You need to obtain a serial abdominal CT scan to follow the laceration and that in abdomen, or you're going to sign him out, of, out to incoming physicians or residents as you have completed your shift. So a few of them, a few of you guys have, uh, there is a mixed answer. Uh, some of you have opted for one. Uh, usually remember in a child, this child is not hemodynamically stable. He is, if he would be hemodynamically unstable, then one would have think of intervention. As this child is hemodynamically stable and most likely the blood loss which he had, uh, it is being controlled. Uh, one should not think of taking him for urgent or for possible splenectomy. <clears throat> Those who have opted for three, if you are going to go for serial abdominal CT, that will going to uh, make them more exposed to the radiations. And you remember that CT scan has a significant amount of radiation exposure. So you need to uh, usually CT scan once done, it has not been repeated. So uh, yes, the correct answer is admit to the PICU for observation and serial blood work needs to be done. What you were going to do, you were going to admit the patient in the PICU, you were going to do the serial hemoglobin checks uh, and coagulopathy uh, every four to six hourly so that you will going to keep an eye on the hemoglobin. Uh, if the hemoglobin remains static, child uh, vital signs are static and he's not being tachycardic and he's, uh, he's been doing fine, then it does shows that the child is not bleeding and he's been able to maintain his hemoglobin. But if the child hemoglobin is been dropping uh, uh, with the passage of time and the child is becoming hemodynamically unstable in terms of tachycardia or in terms of uh, uh, signs of uh, compensated shock, definitely uh, it shows that the child is having active feeding, then you need to think of some intervention. All right. So, uh, one should uh, admit the patient to the PICU for observation. Uh, if there is uh, no splenic or liver laceration or hematomas, there is no need to uh, repeat the imaging. Uh, only grade four injuries require PICU admissions. Uh, formula you can uh, remember hospital length of stay for these children 
grade of injury, uh, which is four plus one day, that is length of stay should be five. And activity restriction that you need to make sure that they are uh, not having active sports or activity restriction should be grade of injury uh, plus two weeks. That is, it should be, uh, if it is grade four, uh, strain acceleration, so it should be six weeks, four plus two is six weeks. So uh, this thing uh, should be kept in mind uh, while you are dealing with these kind of patients. So in the secondary survey, uh, as we have looked into this uh, case, inspect the signs of trauma, bruises, abrasion, and distension, auscultate for bowel sounds, palpate for tenderness and rebound, assess the pelvic stability, and do the fast ultrasound just to make sure that if there is any free fluid in the abdominal arch. CT scan, uh, abdomen, that is CT angiogram after hemodynamically stable and clinical suspicion. Liver spleen injuries are often non-operative. Even if they are uh, actively bleeding, then one must rush them to the VIR, that is uh, interventional radiology, so they can think of angio embolizing the active bleeder rather than you are going to take them to the OR where they're going to bleed like a hell and they are going to die. So uh, that is important uh, in those patients who are having active bleeding, uh, especially intra-abdominal bleed. You can take them to the uh, interventional radiology. They can do the, you can do the CT angiogram. And if they're going to find out the bleeder, they can directly rush him, rush the child to the interventional radiology and they can uh, do the angiomobilization of that. You can assess the renal function. You can send the initial lab work up, uh, to, so that you can give the IV contrast to them. If they remain unstable, as I have discussed, interventional radiology for angiomobilization should be taken on board and explore abdomen in the operating room if the first uh, thing does not help you out. <clears throat> Splenic illustration uh, is the most common abdominal organ which is injured in pediatric patient, uh, usually present with shoulder pain. Abrasion and tenderness in the left upper quadrant, abdominal distension, signs of hypovolemia. If there is a significant intra-abdominal bleed, uh, it is created by the CD scan and operative management is dictated by the hemodynamics, not the grade. So the grade, if it is even grade four, that will not going to uh, dictate the management. It is mainly the hemodynamics. Uh, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable and you are not being able to make him, make his hemodynamic stable, uh, over the period of time and he is having ongoing bleed, then that needs to be dealt with either with the angiomobilization in the uh, interventional radiology or with the surgery. For the liver laceration, uh, uh, they usually present with right shoulder pain, abrasion tenderness in the right upper quadrant, hypovolemia is discussed in the uh, uh, liver uh, splenic lacerations as well. They have elevated transmyonases. CT scan is being done for grading. Operative management. Uh, uh, is dictated by the hemodynamics, not trade as in the case of labor injury, uh, splenic injury, and greater than 90% is being managed non operatively. For the penetrating abdominal trauma, it is usually uncommon, but uh, uh, GI tract is most common, uh, commonly involved in these injuries. Penetrated hollow viscous requires early post operative management. You will be able to find out the ear in the chest x ray or in the CT abdomen, and uh, most abdominal penetrating injuries require operative management. They need to go to the OR because uh, it will going to cause abdominal sepsis if you're not going to treat them early. Uh, other important thing that needs to be taken care of is abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, it is mainly related to uh, intra-abdominal pressure in which induces organ dysfunction within the abdomen itself. So uh, if the intra-abdominal pressure is more than 20 and abdom uh, abdominal it causes decrease in the abdominal perfusion and it can be measured through the bladder pressure. So if one has foleys, uh, you can attach the foleys, you can put a needle uh, in the foleys and you can connect it to the transducer and you can then measure the uh, intra-abdominal pressure uh, through the bladder uh, pressure. And as whatever the intra-abdominal pressure is that we're going to exert the pressure over the bladder and uh, indirectly you are going to get that pressure uh, inside the abdomen. Uh, it causes decreased venous return. It causes mesenteric decreased perfusion, which can lead to gut ischemia. It can lead to decreased renal perfusion and urine output due to decreased renal perfusion. And it can lead to decreased hepatic function and lactate clearance uh, due to the direct pressure effect on the uh, blood supply of these organs. 
So uh, if we will go toward the perineum and rectum, uh, urethral blood, if you were going to find urethral blood, don't pass catheter, obtain urethral cystogram so that you are going to find out whether the urethral is injured or not. Rectal exam, you need to see the tone as well as you need to see if there is blood on the rectal exam or not. Uh, for the secondary survey, the last part is uh, musculoskeletal. That is important. You need to uh, uh, see the limbs as well as muscles. Uh, you need to see deformities in the limbs. You need to get the selected X-ray depending on the examination of the extremities. You need to see the uh, feel the distal pulses and sensations. Usually, if there is a compartment syndrome due to the fracture, pain is out of proportion to the injury. And uh, even if you're going to do slight movement of the hand or feet, especially if you're going to have a severe pain uh, due to the muscle stretch. Remember that paresthesia, paralysis, pulselessness, pallor are the late signs. If the patient is having pain out of proportion and the limp is uh, quite hard, uh, it means that they are having compartment syndrome. It, it needs urgent decompressive facial trauma. So few words about the non-accidental trauma, uh, which is uh, on average seven, uh, seven lakh cases of child uh, abuse. Uh, are being documented and neglect are being documented in the US uh, annually. Unfortunately, uh, developmental country, developing countries does not have uh, data for the non-accidental trauma as we don't have that much robust system uh, in order to identify and cater these uh, epidemiology. Uh, in 2016, the number of child deaths due to abuse and neglect was around uh, 1750. Uh, there is a uh, five-year review of 188 trauma cases of suspected uh, non-accidental trauma with this child abuse. And it shows that 24% uh, of them require pediatric intensive care services and 48% have multiple injuries. So there are a vast major, vast variety of uh, non-accidental trauma. One can have uh, bruises over the pain uh, One can have oozes and hematoma over the head. Uh, this is one of the patients who has presented uh, uh, to the ER with decreased level of consciousness. And uh, you will going to see the CT scan does show uh, uh, multiple uh, fractures in the posterior occiput. The history known as the child slip stairs and that doesn't coincide with the impact of injury on the CT scan which we have. So always be suspicious, uh, suspicious of non-accidental trauma if the history does not coincide with the impact of injury uh, which a child has. So just as a revision uh, for the evaluation of pediatric trauma, you need to do the primary survey, uh, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure, followed by the ample history and head to toe examination. And you need to intervene at any point in time wherever you are going to find out uh, the issue is as we have discussed. So we're going to go through as we have, uh, by the end of this presentation, I hope you will be able to conduct the primary trauma survey. You will be able to uh, conduct the secondary trauma survey with ample history. You will be able to resuscitate the child with trauma. And uh, you now know the basics and management of severe traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injuries, chest trauma, abdominal trauma, and musculoskeletal trauma. Thank you. And uh, if there are any questions, please go ahead and uh, feel free to ask any questions. Assalamualaikum, sir. Thank you, Venom. Yes, Peter. Uh, sir, uh, I want to ask if a traumatic brain injury has like hematoma that has developed, then what should be done surgical uh, intervention? Uh, kab okay, it does depend on uh, what uh, how much it is causing an impact on the uh, ICP. That is, the uh, intracranial pressure here, uh, if it is causing an abrupt increase in the raised ICP and the child is having impending herniation, that child should be rushed to the OR from the emergency department right away. But if uh, the child is uh, hemodynamically stable and uh, child is having 
increase icp but they are being but it is being managed on conservative management and the child is not having herniation uh, you can continue to uh, your conservative management with all neuroprotective measures so that uh, yes uh, you're right that you can give manitol you can give hypertonic spleen you can keep the bed and elevate it at 30 degrees you can hyperventilate them you can intubate them and keep them on ventilation so that you can uh, maintain the normal co2s you can maintain good uh, uh, blood pressures in order to maintain good maps uh, so that you can maintain the cerebral perfusion as well as you can keep the sodium on the higher side in order to uh, make sure that your osmolality remains high so that you can shrink the pain and you can uh, <clears throat> so the question is I hope that answered the question. Thank you, sir. Okay, another question uh, is how to make hypertonic clean if it is not available. So uh, I don't have the recipe for that, but it is usually a uh, pharmacy can prepare hypertonic clean as well. Usually uh, what they can do, they can order 24 24.3% and they can dilute that 24.3% to 3% and they can easily make 3% hypertonic screen from that but you need to have a very concentrated hypertonic screen in order to make that if you don't have hypertonic screen you can use mannitol definitely in, in such cases any more questions if anyone has maybe you can either type it or you can ask it yeah. okay, Navid, i think there are no more questions your presentation was uh, very self-explanatory and you explain everything in so much detail so i think everyone has made out uh, all of it and it was it was a great presentation thank you so much and thank, thank you, you all the participants thank you. Uh, thank you all the participants thank you so much so I, you, I would request i would request all the participants to uh, fill the feedback form also just click it in the chat box so that we can you know uh, make things better for you further uh, someone is asking for your email dr Navi. yes we can So another question uh, uh, has been asked by Bushra, how much ICP should be decreased? Is there any time duration? So ICP should be less than 20. If it is more than 20 uh, and you have intracranial pressure monitoring, that should be uh, taken down uh, by different measures as we have discussed by the use of hypertonic screen or manitol or by the use of other uh, supportive measures like uh, you can keep the blood pressures on the higher side in order to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure as well as you can uh, uh, keep the head and elevated at 30 degrees midline uh, you can keep the sodium on the higher side so these are the measures uh, uh, you can continue to do in order to uh, uh, make sure that the icp is uh, is being lower than 20 if it can if it is persistently more than 20 despite of your medical management then uh, you need to go toward the second year of therapy and you need to then uh, reevaluate the patient for decompressive craniectomy because if the child is having very tight brain within the skull and you are not being able to shrink the brain uh, by all the treatment you need to then make some space for the brain to expand. Otherwise, another uh, brain will going to have ischemia and uh, uh, the outcome will be detrimental. Another question was hypertonic screen or mannitol, which one is better? Uh, usually, uh, uh, hypertonic screen is better in terms of uh, it is better tolerated uh, in patient. It can also be used in resuscitating the patient who are hypotensive. The only uh, the drawback of mannitol is that it causes uh, diuresis and it can cause hypotension. 
So uh, hypotension in these cases with raised ICP is detrimental and there can cause severe uh, 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 ischemic insult to the brain. So that's the reason why people don't use mannitol nowadays. They usually use hypotonic serine in a dose of three to five mLs per kg in to six to eight hourly or in, in, in continuous infusion 0.1 to one mL per kg per hour. And they titrate to keep the sodium on the higher side around in 150s mainly and sometimes if the uh, brain is tight and the icp is on the higher side they usually keep it uh, in 160s as well uh, uh, and also uh, uh, sometimes they usually check the osmolality uh, hypertonic line is uh, also better tolerated in terms of uh, one can even tolerate the osmolality of 360 to 350 uh, while uh, that in case of mannitol uh, uh, usually uh, 320 is a uh, cutoff for the mannitol uh, uh, for, from the osmolality point of view. Mannitol is now only being used in uh, impending herniation patient uh, uh, as a uh, uh, emergency management, uh, but most commonly now hypertonic screen is being used. So how to monitor uh, if ICP monitor is not available? So uh, that's a pretty good question uh, because uh, uh, although uh, we don't have ICP monitor, one thing uh, that can be done uh, is if the neurosurgeon can insert an EVD uh, that can give you the reading, if you can attach it to the task user, that can give you the reading on the monitor and uh, that can give you the ICP uh, monitoring as well. However, if you don't have invasive monitoring, one can do the optic nerve sheet diameter as well. And if it is, uh, there are different cutoffs uh, in the infants, children, and uh, in the adolescent. And uh, if it is more than uh, five in the children, and if it is more than 5.5, uh, uh, then uh, the patient is said to have raised ICP and it should be dealt with. I hope that answered the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Naveed. Let's find the session. Love is everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Thank you very much. Love is.